Good afternoon, everybody. Um, gives me great pleasure to introduce Dave this afternoon. I'm sure it's going to be a fantastic talk. Um, looking forward to it. I'm sure you are too. Thank you, Dave. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the Linux Foundation for getting me here. I would never have come. Um, and I'm really happy to be able to talk about this subject in front of an audience in a portion of the world that I haven't been recently. So this talk is about how internet congestion control actually works in the buffer bloated age. And before we went on film, I asked people how many people had heard of buffer bloat before. Raise your hands again. Ten years ago, nobody understood this concept, and the word didn't exist. And it's been wonderful watching it progress and in knowledge of how queues work over this time. So in this talk, I'm going to give an introduction to how network congestion control works. How many of you think you understand how network congestion control works? Good. So using packets as people, <laughs> I might be convey a, in, a, an intuition for how it actually works. But if you really want to know how it works, there's about 300 papers you need to read and a whole lot of code. So I'm hoping that just merely by conveying some intuition, you'll be able to make better decisions in the future. So I'm going to use as a demo. Uh, we've managed to recruit 12 people to act as packets, and I'll bring them up about six slides in. Be ready. <laughs> OK. I'm going to discuss Windows protocols, the TCP Reno and Cubic uh, variants, the impact of VoIP and gaming traffic, a concept called fair queuing. Who's heard of fair queuing? Yeah. And active queue management? Good. OK. BB, and if I have time, and only if I have time, I'm going to try to cover some new developments in the, in the world, notably BBR and ECN. But I'm not sure if I'll get there or not. So a little bit about me. Um, Jim Geddes uh, discovered the concept of buffer bloat and how bad it was. And I was living in Nicaragua at the time, and I just assumed that it was my tin cans and string attacking me to the rest of the network. But no, it was a worldwide and difficult phenomenon. And my dream, starting in 1991, all I wanted to do, my drummer would never show up to gigs. <laughs> and all I wanted to do was plug my guitar into the wall and play with him across town. And the speed of light is across town was 36 microseconds. And we played in a band together. I couldn't be that close to him. You know, I had to be at least five milliseconds, maybe 10 milliseconds away. I like to hang with a bass player. Uh, the drummer was just too loud for me. So the speed of sound in air was so much slower than the speed of light that I just could plug this in and I'd be playing with a drummer across town. And this was in 1991. And I thought this facility would exist by 1998 at the latest. And boy, was I wrong. <laughs> had no idea. So uh, these days, I, I helped found the Buffer Blow Project with Jim Geddes. I worked on speeding up Wi-Fi by a lot in particular. I also, uh, where can I put this uh, safe? There we go. Uh, the Sarawart Project. Does anybody here use OpenWRT? That's wonderful. So Sarawart fed back into OpenWRT, and from that uh, iteration phase, we managed to put it in the Linux and the other stuff that was great. Uh, make Wi-Fi fast. Currently, I'm working on the ECN SANE project. Anybody using Cake yet? <coughs> Cake is uh, the latest and greatest output of the buffer bloat project that was mainlined in Linux 4.19. And it's, uh, it's pretty cool. I'm not going to talk about it much. And after all the theory work that we did in the buffer bloat project was done, and all the technical work was done, and all the coding was done, and all the testing was done, and users had it, we had to take it to the IETF and try to standardize it, which took six years. I had hair. <laughs> uh, and these days, I work off of contracts and take donations to keep myself interested in doing this stuff. So what is congestion control? Internet congestion control algorithms govern how multiple flows from multiple sources and destinations ultimately share the network more or less fairly when crossing the bottleneck links. It means that your packets from Google and your packets from your neighbor and your packets from your uh, Akamai and your packets from your cross town, they all have to mix together in order to share the network fairly, ultimately. And if we didn't have a set of protocols that we agreed upon in places like the IETF, mathematically proven to be stable, 
the Internet would have collapsed. And in fact, it did in 1986. Um, an early version of the Internet went from 56K bits per second to 30 bits per second before Van Jacobsen invented all the protocols that we use today to manage traffic. Without congestion control, as I said, it would stop working. And I have to say that when we started the Buffer Blow project, goodly portions of the Internet looked likely that they were going to stop working. And even in fact today, there's a lot of networks that don't work very well because they didn't embrace deeply the congestion control principles. So we formed BufferBloat.net back in 2011 after we figured out that excessive buffering was trashing the Internet. We would see buffers so big that they would take seconds. Stuff would go around the moon. One satellite provider actually had 860 seconds worth of buffering in their system. <laughs> they went out of business. <laughs> but that's enough buffering to go to the Mars and back. And you don't need that much buffering. Throughout this talk, I'm going to talk about the point of trying to fill just enough buffer to keep the flow going. And the rest of the time, you want to fill the path. So all these algorithms are published. All the technology is done. It's in every Linux and every BSD system out there today. It's all standardized, even. The problem is, is that we still have about a billion boxes or more to fix. And it's taking a while for the internet to upgrade. This is a test I did at the LCA Wi-Fi network earlier this week. And it kind of illustrates the core problem that, we're going to, that we have solved but not fully deployed yet. When I started this particular test, I had 10 milliseconds of buffering between me and APNIC in Brisbane. It's actually less than that, but Wi-Fi has some overheads. As soon as I began a download, you see the download, the green is the download, the, uh, the orange is the ping. I have this spike here, and then you can see the ping slowly going higher and higher. It kind of balances out where I'm actually getting, look, I'm getting 40, roughly 40 megabits worth of bandwidth with these weird spikes. And 50 seconds into the test, the amount of bandwidth available to me over the Wi-Fi dropped in half. And at that point, since it dropped in half, the amount of buffering experienced, the amount of latency experienced on this thing, crept to over 1.6 seconds. It went from 10 milliseconds to 1.6 seconds. Latency and bandwidth are interrelated in this inverse way throughout many devices in the Internet today. And the goal of the buffer bloat effort was to somehow hold latencies low or constant, no matter how much bandwidth you have. If you had DSL, you should have minimal latency. If you're in the data center, you should have minimal latency, is what we were at chasing. You can see these inversions, latency versus throughput, latency versus throughput, which is a really bad problem on Wi-Fi and 3G and DSL and cable and so forth. Because this was such a difficult theory problem, the Internet decided to evolve in a different way. Most stuff is very short transactions. You have rate-limited streaming now, like Netflix, and old applications. Anybody here ever do uploads? Use SSH? Keep your hands up. That's good. Uh, do you ever play a game? Do a video conference? The, pro the buffer bloat problem affects all those applications tremendously. But we've had piecemeal things deploying end to end rather than doing the work to fix all the routers in the world. Now I get to bring up some of you guys to explain what the heck I was trying to talk about. Can I get some volunteers up, please? Daniel, are you going to be, be my gateway over there? All right, I'm going to need a couple VoIP. What was the VoIP packet? I need three VoIP packets, though. Uh, two, VoIPs. two VoIPs. All right. Cool. Now all of you guys go on that far wall over there. Come on in. All right. So. I won't throw anything at you. So this is Daniel, who I met last night. He's going to act as, as the bottleneck, bottleneck link, OK? He's going to let a, a burst of you through when I tell him to. Right. And I'm going to do other stuff. Now, when we lose a packet, 
Some of you are familiar with what happens. The next packet notices that there was a loss, and it carries the information saying, I was lost. So every time we lose a packet, pair up with the next packet that comes and parade back to come talk to people. So you uh, stand right about there. I'm going to form a loop between here and here. You good? All right. Here we go. The first thing we're going to start with is data transfer about Windows. It's 1975. We have X modem. I need three pe people to come forward right now. OK? So I want a little bit of data. Give me some data. It's great. That's cool. Turn around again. Send it back. Oh, wow, I got some data. Oh, cool, I got data. Just keep, keep one circle. So when you have a really short distance, it's totally OK. One packet at a time. One packet at a time. It's totally OK to, just to do an acknowledgment like that. All right? But when you step out into the real world, where you have a distance between stuff, there's room in the network to store the data. And if you send one packet at a time, just one, any lollygags across there, even though I only have 40 minutes to give this talk, thank you for the data. Tell them I need more data. Send me some more data. <laughs> Keep lollygagging. Yeah, great. I need more data. And these are actually operating at the speed of light, but they're a little out of shape. <laughs> oh, I missed that one. Sorry. <laughs> now there is, give me one more piece of data. Now there is an issue. We need to acknowledge each piece of data as it comes in. If I lost him, <laughs> right, he's gone. <laughs> Some timeout's going to happen. Something will happen. You'll send, hey, give me some more data. One more. Just one more. Oh, wow. Well, I don't need you. Get back there. But tell them I need him again. Go back with him. <laughs> OK. Send him back to me. At light speed. Come on, get some exercise going. Get in there. All right, go back. So that's a, a, a non-windowed file transfer that does not work because we need to as work as well as it could because we need to transfer fill stuff in the network. We need to fill the pipe and not the queue. Okay. Windowed protocols came about after that. That's we noticed this problem. And I need to kind of explain that out on the internet you have currently you have a hundred gigabytes, all right, of bandwidth from the servers in the data center. And then it needs to go through a couple of funnels until it goes smaller and smaller and smaller until it typically emits at less than 10 megabits out of the user. This is many orders of magnitude difference. And we need to compensate for the fact that you're sending stuff in the server, 100 gigabits, and it's got to come out at 10. <laughs> so this is a bottleneck. So this guy here would represent 100 gigabits. It's not the scale. <laughs> Getting squeezed through that bottleneck going to receiver, and then being sent, acknowledgments being sent back. So the next big portion of the TCP protocol suite is called the TCP initial window. And it's a pretty cool concept. The idea is that, hey, I need a bunch of data. Send it to me. And uh, the initial TCP window is typically four um, everywhere except Linux. It's 10 in Linux. The thing is, I didn't get enough volunteers to do IW10, so we're going to do four. <laughs> Um, and I'm not really fond of this. So initial window, what I like is four of you packets to come up and, and stop, be, re be regulated by Daniel there. So I send a, I, I can do more about the protocol, but I want some data. Can I have some, uh, my first portion of my data stream? Four of you come on up, all of you together at light speed. That's great. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Go tell those other guys that I need more data now. <laughs> all you guys get in line. Now, each and every one of those packets releases two more packets. And that's really cool. All right, keep going. All of you go. All right, keep coming. Keep coming. Keep coming. Yes, acknowledgments. That's right. You got it. Keep coming. Everybody keep going. And you see how all these guys are flowing and how they're filling the queue? OK. Stop. <laughs> there was. <laughs> I don't, I'm not going to do that. That's the advanced class. <laughs> So I need you guys to line up a little bit better and behave more orderly on her behalf <laughs> to make sure that we actually get the theory right. 
So that initial burst is quite often all you need. I need four packets, I'm done. And most of the internet has very short bursts. It doesn't have that enormous sweaty flow that we just went through. Um, and that's all pretty good. Let me go working on my next slide. So there's two sets of algorithms. And these are here to keep the internet from collapsing. They're really important for the stability of the internet. If we didn't have something like these two algorithms in play, it would collapse again like it did in 1986. In 1986, we had to reboot the whole internet by emailing tapes to the Postal Service. So the first phase of TCP, when you first start that first connection, is called slow start. It's not very slow, but it's slower than what we had when it crashed in 86. And it means that every time you send one packet, you release two more. It increases exponentially until you finally get a packet loss, this phase right here. And it switches into a different phase called congestion avoidance, which has a method called additive increase. After dropping the rate by half, additive increase to slowly grow the rate so it's stable. So I'm going to do that, hopefully, a little less fun involved, just to try to get that into people's mind before I talk about the next thing. So I'd like my IW4 window to show up. Give me four packets. Again, stay in line so we don't have any reordering. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You go back. Each one of those packets releases two more packets, but fast. You've got to fill the pipe. All right, packets freeze. I don't need any buffering. This is being stored in the network. That's pretty cool. Now, come, freeze again. You've entered my buffer. That's cool. I'm, 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 I'm going fast. Thank you. Come here. That's it. Freeze. All right, you're in my buffer. You were my buffer. Yeah, you're freezing. You keep, you keep coming. I, ran, I am running at a slow rate. You keep coming. You keep coming. Stop. No, that's not an ordering thing. Get back in there. <laughs> Anyway, stop right there. So now we finished filling the pipe. We have a couple things in the pipe, but now we filled the inbound queue. You, I, I free, you were free to go. <laughs> but not these guys yet. Now, we used to have a concept called the bandwidth delay product, where we needed to have enough buffering to match the bandwidth. No, no, go back in line. I wasn't sending you back there. <laughs> Packets aren't banished forever. <laughs> Just because I dropped you doesn't mean I don't like you. <laughs> so I have this buffer now. And every packet, go ahead, you go through. But you're still, I'm moving at a slower rate. These guys are running at 100 gigabits. I'm running at 10. You go through. OK, stop. So you're going to release two more packets into the pipe. And my buffer is getting filler. Stop. OK. And that's a pretty long queue. You know? And uh, it turns out that my hardware here only has a six packet queue. One, two, three, four. Oh, I'm sorry, Andrew. <laughs> and I'm sorry, whoever the hell you are. <laughs> no, but, but stay, stay here, stay here. So I've managed to drop these two guys. All right? You guys stay right where you are. Just follow with the queue along. So you come through. OK? Get back there. You come through. Slowly, you get back there. I'm sending two more packets through here. Now, this buffer has lost some packets, and I've emptied it some. You guys stay there. Keep going. You go through. You go through. You go through. Now, I've noticed that these two characters weren't in my stream. So I'm going to mark you, and you guys are going to walk back together. <laughs> All right, back that way. No, no, get back. In, you're, you're coming through me. This, so you're, you're with him. This is what's called a sack packet. I'm acknowledging two lost packets. And don't they look lost to you? So you jump, jump in the head again. OK, nice to have you back. Keep going through. Keep going through. Keep going through. Keep going through. Now, what that loss, stop right there. Keep going through. What that loss indicated 
was that A, we need to retransmit these guys, and we need to tell the sender to slow down, to send stuff less fast, so I don't fill this queue so much. So you guys can lollygag half the speed of light this time. <laughs> Keep lollygagging. Come through again slowly. Hold on one here. Lollygag some more. And the thing is, every time now that this happens, these guys start speeding up again. Give me more, guys. Come on. Back to three quarters of the speed of light. Keep going. Go around. Come on, everybody. Move. Speed of light. And all of a sudden, my rate has, I can't control it anymore. So you're going here and here. And then you can see this buffer. It's building up again. And oh my god, keep you going. One, two, three, four. Oh, I'm sorry, man. <laughs> <laughs> Stay right where you are. Come through again. Keep going. And these guys are still doubling in speed. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. But I've lost this guy. And finally, the other side notices he's gone. You noticed. And you come with him. That's cool. <laughs> And we signal the other side here in this clock saying, please resend that. <laughs> See, they're going up and down and up and down. OK? Now that you have that in your heads, you know, occasionally lose a packet and fix it while I fix the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> All right, stop where you are then. Some independent minded packets you are. <laughs> Get back in a good line. Now, this oscillation is called the TCP sawtooth. It is utterly required for the stability of the internet for it to work. If you have more than one flow from more than one source, these sawtooth patterns, where it goes up, drops in half, goes up, drops in half, all go to give you a fair share of the bandwidth if you have a reasonable amount of buffering. Most TCPs rely on that loss to back the rate off by a half. That's mathematically proven. 11 orders of magnitude is a safe number to have to keep the internet from collapsing again like it did in 1986. However, in those days, we had a four packet buffer. These days, it's frequently measured in the thousands and sometimes measured in seconds. And we didn't design TCP for that. Timely loss or marking is necessary for the network's correct operation. To try to demonstrate that, imagine that we have a second's worth of buffering. You guys come forward. Four packets. Cool. Now, we're going to pretend there's already a buffer in place that's, second, that's a half a second long, which means that actually you can't come to me. You got to go down that wall, all of you guys. And come back around. More of you come? We don't know. Keep coming. Keep following those guys. Go back. No, you're going this way. No, keep going. OK, keep going, all of you. Keep going. OK. And wow, we filled what we think the pipe is. Keep going. In fact, you got to go over there now. And I'm going to go back around there. <laughs> I'm not kidding, really. I mean, this is what seconds of buffering looks like to TCP. It can't figure out what the capacity is. Keep going. OK. Now, eventually, I will still run out of buffer capacity. And I'll drop a packet. There's a thing called RFC 970. If you, have a, if you run out of buffers, keep going. Now, you guys have finally arrived. Go back to that wall there. And unfortunately, right, you stop right there. I'll use Andrew. Come on, Andrew. Oh, got you guys. So, oh my god, I dropped a packet finally <laughs> after seconds of buffering. So great, you got to go back and tell these things here that you lost that packet. And then, there we go, there you go. And all these guys get, can't get delivered anymore. So the lost packet guy, go get some exercise. <laughs> Walk in there, over here, around there, come on back. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, you're cheating. <laughs> Anyway, keep going, guys. Go ahead, keep walking. I need to change slides. <laughs> OK. Now, this is something that shows up in user behavior. Um, when you finally get to an event like this where you've lost a packet, you have an enormous amount of buffering, your thing goes, buffering. 
This is what you actually see. <laughs> so the goal in life, TCP, is to try to keep the queues short and the <laughs> signaling level high. Thank you very much for making that journey for me. <laughs> and rather than making you rest for a while if you need to, don't sit down, though. I still need you for a couple more things. So in the 80s, we designed TCP with an ACK clock. Each one of those ACKs released more packets or indicated that we had a loss and said slow down and fix that. It's actually way more complicated than this, but I don't have time to do that part. The thing was is the idea of the ACK clock is a very unreliable idea. Can I get four packets to come to me? One, two, three, four. Cool, I got my thing going here. But come here, stop on this side. You, you, you stop her. Now, this upstream portion of the link can be blocked for any other number of reasons. There can be other stuff there. And you have no, I mean, you can't, you, you can't get here yet. So this one person goes, and this guy's going really, really slowly for no reason that you can perceive. Come on, give me, give him, get two. I thought you understood TCP by now. <laughs> And then we do that so that the round trip is all we can measure in this design of TCP. And we can have the clock keep going. Yeah, you remember every, every time we release one of you, you know, you, you were doing, you're still I'm on still, slow yeah, start. Still on slow start. All right, well, sorry. Let's go. <laughs> Congestion <laughs> avoidance is simple. You guys come through. But anyway, so we're dependent on this act clock. You can come through. I'm done with loss right now. Right. Thank you. <laughs> the core thing I want to know is that. Damn near every T, this is one of the things that really ticks me off. Every single TCP researcher, except a few people I know, focuses on one way delay and not on the delays on the upstream link. And usually your upstream link is running at one tenth or less the bandwidth you have. And if you try to send packets in both directions, including data, by the way, acts are really small. <laughs> 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 And, 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 and they, you too, and they fit, and they fit into a, into a really bandwidth constrained link. But if you have those guys, so you have a 10 megabit downlink, a 1 megabit uplink, your acts are really small. As soon as you do your big upload, it's like, and that slows down and, and misinterprets stuff going in the other direction. Ah. How am I doing for time, by the way? 15 I have 15 minutes left? I might make it. All right. There is a lot of problems with excessive buffering on the network. I'm going to get to the solutions, I hope, with the time I have available. And one of the most common ones, and you'll see this on cell phones a lot, instead of doing anything smart with the queue, send me four packets. Thank you, Daniel. So cool, thank you very much for coming. Thank you, keep going back. Thank you. But uh, tell that guy, I can, I can only handle four packets. Uh, send, send me one, two, three, four total. And this is called clamping the receive window. Just four, just four at a time. It's very inefficient in that I can't necessarily fill the queue, but I've managed to not fill the buffer. Choices. But you see this in cell phones a lot. All right, I need some VoIP packets. Who do I have for VoIP? One, two, three. All right, you guys, clearly identify yourself. Wave with, no, okay, you help. hold your hands in the air. That's good. I'm a VoIP packet. <laughs> VoIP is very, VoIP and DNS and gaming packets are very different from TCP. They're usually very small. Try to imagine that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And they come out of fixed, very small individual. You know, so a simple VoIP uh, connection is one tiny packet every 20 milliseconds. So send me, send me a VoIP thing. Hi. There. That. It's actually it's much smaller. That syllables. 20 milliseconds is quite is tiny. Okay. Now you guys, I need, still need you guys. Okay. You're still being Mr. Captain VoIP. So keep keep doing the VoIP thing. I'm VoIP. Keep doing that. Hi, I'm VoIP. But spread out a little bit more. Hi. I'm, I'm VoIP. VoIP. 
And, <laughs> and then we release a TCP flow into this. Give me four packets. Get in line, though. <laughs> One, two, hi. Hi. All right, you guys, more TCP packets. <laughs> Way more TCP. All right, where's my VoIP guy? VoIP there, VoIP there. All right, so TCP goes through, TCP goes through. VoIP. VoIP. Keep right. going through, and we have way more. Who says, keep, raise your hand, Mr. Voigt. All right, now stop. The sawtooth, riding this sawtooth, the com competition between these two, you see how those two Voigt packets ended up back to back? That's the kind of behavior you get. And you also get jitter from this. So you have higher. <laughs> <laughs> and these two tra traffic does not coexist very well. So, I, mean, I have a picture of this one, but so it's called riding a sawtooth. And that's a picture of what it looks like. So, our original VoIP call was 20 milliseconds apart in the same room, just like I'm talking to you guys. I'm 20 milliseconds from that person, I'm projecting. As soon as you have the TCP connection in there, the jitter, in this ideal case, increased to over 80 milliseconds. And the way that VoIP works, is that it'll look at the peak, the maximum it sees of jitter from the other flows, and then delay your packets. So you're talking across the room in a steady rate. <laughs> and because of buffer bloat, sometimes that becomes hundreds of milliseconds long. You guys get all get back in line. How many people like VoIP? <laughs> Video conferencing, <laughs> gaming, stuff like that. I like those things myself. So there's a really cool solution to this. I need the VoIP guys all in a row. I need the TCP guys all in a row. Stop! Get back behind Daniel. <laughs> OK? Daniel, I want you to release one TCP packet. Just one. One packet. One VoIP packet. One TCP packet. OK? In, in a row, you guys are all queued up together. Keep going. I'm VoIP, TCP, VoIP, TCP, VoIP. Now, the, th the way this works out is that we interleave each one of these kinds of packets, and they do not see VoIP, and they do not see the TCP sawtooth at all. <laughs> VoIP, TCP, VoIP, TCP, VoIP. <laughs> OK. All right, guys, get back in line. Thank you so much. And. Uh, <laughs> Ten minutes? So fair queuing is a technique that is part of the FFQ Caudal algorithm. And it's part of it's been a technique known for years, and it's probably the most common technique for mixing up mixing up different kinds of flows so that you get the minimum amount of latency for them. We still have to have some kind of algorithm though that can look at the size of the queue. We don't know the right size for a queue. At a small, at, at one megabit, it's maybe two packets. At a gigabit, I don't know, Andrew, 100,000, 10,000, I don't work in that field. Mm. Half a million. Half a million. So <laughs> the right answer is kind of unknown. Give me four packets. Thank you. Stop. Now, we filled the queue. That you guys keep coming forward. You guys stop. I've now filled the queue, and my intelligent Q management algorithm says, well, dang, that's a little bit much for my current measured bandwidth. And uh, some AQM algorithms will like, look at, at the end of the queue and say, well, I'm going to drop that guy and signal that back. But Cuddle is something pretty neat. It looks at you and says, this queue's too long. I'm sorry. <laughs> Stay where you are. Stay where you are. You come through. The neat thing about this, you, sir, the neat thing about this particular algorithm in Cuddle, come on, you two go together, is that Keep coming, you guys here. Now stop, freeze for a second. So I still have a full queue. The signal that I lost the packet has gone back to the sender. So you come back in. I've signaled the sender to slow down, and I've sent the new packet. Two of you come through here, through here. So give me, give me more packets, more packets, and stop right there. So wow, I have four packets in this queue. And I look, oh, it's too long. I'm sorry, man. Just go right there. But the fact that I've lost the packet, you two people, go back together. We moderate the queue length, and you guys keep flowing through. 
to where we can manage to reduce the Q depths observed from where we went from seconds to five milliseconds. And that was an enormous two order of magnitude breakthrough that Kala was in 2018. By combining fair queuing, oops, by combining fair queuing and the Caudill AQM, we went from a world where we frequently saw seconds of queuing on almost every device in the world to five milliseconds. We were filling the pipe and not the queue. It's kind of a compelling story. This is a DSL modem. You do a big upload, it would explain the path to over a second to where it was almost immeasurable. Ten, ten, in the case of DSL, 10 milliseconds. People are always going about, hey, fiber is faster. It's, and fiber actually really is, actually. But fiber it also has a minimal amount of buffering, uh, which also makes it feel faster. Your queues never fill. It says, in this case, this is Sonic Fiber in San Francisco, which only has 60 milliseconds of buffering, which is like 10 times better than anybody else. <laughs> However, if you apply an FQ cutter like algorithm, in, in, in this case, my VoIP packets never exper ex actually experienced two milliseconds of latency on the path. And my dream in 1991 was to be able to plug my guitar into the wall and play with a drummer across town. Two milliseconds is about right. 25 years worth of work on the internet. <laughs> that drummer's gone deaf. <laughs> Can finally make it work. But that applies to just about anything. You can make fiber better by factor of 30 by applying these algorithms. And I'm pretty sure your experience will be better. Earlier in this thing here, how many of you are running FQ Coddle? The answer to that is OS X. Raise your hand. Uh, iOS on your phone. Keep, keep them up. iOS on your phone. Keep them up. Running Linux. Get them up. How many of you are free BSD? Not bad. Pretty universal these days. On almost everything except the gear that you're buying for routers, etc. And even then it's just beginning to start to appear. So from zero to a billion users, an unbelievably faster internet. I still keep having to ask people to focus a little bit on the problem and help move it along. It's just been an almost entirely all volunteer product project. In fact, all my volunteers, please come forth. And line up right here. All of you. Andrew was an early volunteer. I used your VoIP gear. Good. Did it work? Did it work? After I did this to it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who else here I recognize, but all of you have been using this stuff, making the internet better, taking it up into Linux, distributing it, and I want to thank you for not only doing that, but for doing your part to make the internet better by doing a really silly demo today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. You can sit down. <laughs> now, I don't want to pick on the conference organizers. Nearly every conference I've been to has very old Wi-Fi or very old this and that. And this is the behavior you typically see today. You put a load on it, the latency clause climbs into seconds. I want to apologize to everybody that was inconvenienced while I was running this test. <laughs> the amazing thing, I, I'm going to convert that particular plot to what's called a CDF plot. And that gives you the range of latency that you would see on this particular connection, peaking at about over a second. And the median is about 650 milliseconds. And I got to admit, despite having everyone in this room, despite having a billion plus users, sometimes I get a little depressed. And I was at the Speakers Different concert uh, thing yet last night, and I looked up, and wow, there was an ubiquity access point on the ceiling. You see this little line there, a little green line with the latency? That's what that access point did at the speaker's dinner, because it has most of the stuff in it. So all we have to do is a software upgrade, replace about another billion boxes. The internet will always be faster, better, and less annoying. And uh, you got any questions? Thank you.
Hello. Uh, so I was wondering, uh, do you have a line into some of the these big proprietary companies that maybe haven't implemented your software um, yet? Um, could you try repeating that just a little bit more? You're talking about aligning to what company is doing what? Uh, I, was, I was wondering if you have uh, contacts in the big companies that haven't yet implemented your algorithm. Well, I wouldn't necessarily contacts. I, I, I'm the annoyer in chief. Um, so I, what I've been trying to do is set up competitive pressure saying, look, Ubiquity has this. Microtech, what are you waiting for? And, uh, and that's been gone to work. Um, so I know almost everybody has deployed this. Again, it's, all this is open source patent-free, and anyone that's running a modern Linux kernel can very easily deploy it. So like, for example, Eero and Google Wi-Fi and Google Fiber, I think, in the end, and uh, almost all the mesh Wi-Fi routers have this kind of stuff, and it's in dozens of fire, firewall products and in your laptop. Um, so if you want to talk to me about finding a gig in this area, um, you can, you can, there's mailing list. I'll be glad to help you. Anybody else? Uh, Follow-on question. So, have have you had conversations with Juniper and Cisco and Arista and those network vendors at all? So I have. All right. So, I didn't. I was going to do a song while I was here. Juniper, in particular, and Arista. I have a marketing strategy, and it goes like this: I like big buffs, and I cannot lie. Um, they feel that large buffers are a marketing feature, and it is for a couple kinds of traffic, but not, inter not most of the traffic on the Internet. So, yes, we've had that conversation. Yes, alcohol was involved. Yes, the engineers mostly are um, on the side, the low-level people, but the marketing folk want to sell big buffers. Uh, Cisco did release an interesting algorithm called, is it AFD, Andrew? AFD and Pi. There's more than, more than just FQ Cobble in the world. Um, so it is my hope that the big guys, but most of those guys are using switch chips like the Tofino and stuff like that. So um, people have actually managed to implement this algorithm in the P4 protocol on the Tofino. Uh, so we'll see this deployed by people smart enough to program P4, of which I'm not one. Anything else? Oh, one more I have. Are we good? Or am I done? Uh, I know that many of the higher level protocols, so HTTP 3 is now over UDP rather than TCP. Do you expect the distribution of traffic types to change over time? Would this affect that work much? It won't affect this work much. However, it is a we do need to co-design new, new TCP-like protocols with new AQMs. In particular, I didn't get to it. Uh, there's an effort involving ECN and the IETF, which is requires beer to discuss. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for having me. And a big hand, big hand, packets stand up, and a big hand on my packets. I think I could speak for everyone in the room when I say that was an incredibly entertaining talk, and uh, I think we've all learned a lot about packets ourselves. Um, as a token of appreciation, I'd just like to present you with this book from LCA, and if we could all just give Dave another thanks.